And then let me go to screen share. All right. Last time I, I told you a parable, one that you had never heard before because it's not in the Bible. But I think as we interpreted it, we saw that we had different interpretations and that's the nature of parables. They are in a sense subjective. When we hear them, we have to try to understand what the person who tells it is meaning. And that's not always clear especially if you are not tuned in uh, to that person, to what he is about, to what he's saying. And um, so there is some flexibility there, but yet we know in Jesus' parables that they had a particular meaning. And sometimes Jesus gives us the meanings of those parables. Let's begin by asking the question, what is a parable? We generally think of a parable as being a story that has a spiritual application, which it often is. And that's generally how we're going to be using the term parable in this lesson. But the biblical meaning of that word parable is broader than simply a story. The Greek word is parabole. The Hebrew word is masal, and both have a broad range of meanings. So let us look at the uh, meanings of the New Testament in the New Testament here. Uh, the various meanings of parable, according to Klein uh, Snodgrass, is the first meaning is a proverb. Luke 4.23, Jesus said to them, surely you will quote this proverb for me, Physician, heal yourself. Now, this is a saying. Um, all of us in our cultures have proverbs. And uh, this word proverb here in this verse is the word parabole, the same word as is used for a parable as a story. Next, we have a riddle. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. A riddle. How can Satan drive out Satan? And then he uh, gives the answer to the riddle uh, right next here. So this riddle is called a parable, a parable A. I believe that in Matthew 22, 41 to 46, we also have a riddle. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, how is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David then calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply, and from that day, no one dared ask him any more questions. Now, that is not a story, and in fact, it's not called a parable, but I think it is an example of a riddle uh, there in the teaching of Jesus. An example from the Old Testament is uh, told by Samson, out of the eater, something to eat, out of the strong, something sweet. Uh, who can tell me what the meaning of this riddle is? Out of the eater, something sweet. Out of the strong, something 
uh, something sweet. Out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. Does anybody about know the, the lion about the, and the honeybees? Lion. The lion, okay. And, and Sam? Yeah, the lion and the honey from the from the bees that were right. in the lion's body. All right. He uh, came across the skeleton of a lion, and the bees had made a hive there in it. Uh, but that is an example of a riddle. Here's a modern day example. Oh, I don't have it on there. Um, okay, give me the answer to this. Mary's father had five daughters, Nana, Nene, Nini, Nono. What is the fifth daughter's name? Mary. Mary. Mary, Mary. okay. <laughs> okay, most people say Nunu. Okay. Here's, a, here's another one. A dad and his son were riding their bikes and crashed. Two ambulances came and took them to different hospitals. The man's son was in the operating room and the doctor said, I can't operate on you. You're my son. How is that possible? Mom? What's that? Mother. The mother? Okay, it was his mother. Okay. You all are sharp. Uh, <laughs> you get it. The doctor was his mom. Okay, let's go on. A, a parable lay, parable, can refer to a comparison. Uh, Matthew, Matthew 13, 33. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into 60 pounds of flour until it worked all the way through the door. Again, this is not a story, but it's a comparison between two things. It's a comparison of the kingdom of heaven and yeast uh, in dough. Also, it can be contrast. In Luke 18, 1 to 8, then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find uh, faith on the earth? Here there is a contrast between the unjust judge and God. This is the way the unjust judge is, but in contrast to that, this is the way God is. So a parable can be a contrast. Uh, it can also be a simple story, uh, like in Luke 13, 6 to 9. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but it, he did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. So it could be a simple story like this, or it could be a more complex story. 
uh, for example, the, uh, the parable of the wedding banquet in Matthew 22, 1 to 4, would be an example of that. And we're not going to take time to read all of that uh, right now. There are parables in both the Old and the New Testament. The most familiar Old Testament parable is the one told by Nathan to David after David's affair with Bathsheba in 2 Samuel 12, 1 to 4. Uh, we read that before when we were dealing with 2 Samuel chapter 7. Uh, let me just quickly read it again. There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. And of course, David's response to this is, uh, that rich man's going to pay. And then Nathan points his finger at David and says, you are the man. A powerful lesson here told through a parable. All right. Um, do you have questions or comments here at this point? Okay, you see that there's a, there's a, a broad meaning to this word parable, even though for most of it in our mind, it's a story, okay? And that's the way that we're primarily gonna be using it here in the class. Any questions or comments? All right, what I would like to do here is um, read the parable of the prodigal son. And then I would like us to, buy, to divide into breakout rooms. Let me ask you, how many of you have been in breakout rooms on Zoom? Can I see your hand? So most of you have. I have not used breakout rooms. So this is brand new for me. So I'm gonna give it a try and we'll see how it works. Let me go down and uh, bring up the story of the prodigal son. All right. Do you have do you have the story of the prodigal son there on your screen? Do you? Okay. Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set out for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pig, pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. 
But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called on one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again and he was lost and is found. All right, uh, I would like to break you up into groups of uh, four or five. And I want you to answer the question, who is the main character of this parable? And what is the main point of this parable? So let me see how to do this. Let me stop the share. And let me find breakout rooms. Okay. I'll assign five people to each room and we'll try to create the rooms now. And you'll have 15 minutes. So these are the rooms. And they will close automatically in 15 minutes. And you will have one minute a warning at the end. All right. Okay, is this working? Can somebody tell me if it's working? Peter Usud, are you in a group? All right, welcome back. Can you all hear me? Okay, good. Loud and clear, sir. Okay, yes, sir. what did we think about this parable? Um, let me ask you, how many of you felt that the main character in this parable was God, uh, or was the father in the parable? Can I just see your hand? A group agrees. Okay, well, hold them up there. Let me just count. One, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Okay. How many of you felt that the prodigal son 
was the uh, main character. Let me see your hand. One, uh, two, three, okay. And how many of you felt that the elder brother was the main character? Okay, one, just one? Okay, so we got 13 and three and one. We have 17. Um, I can't see some of you. Uh, Sharon and Phineas are, are uh, off there. Okay, um, so most of you believe that the main character here is the, uh, the father. <clears throat> so maybe, maybe if that's true, it should be renamed to the, uh, the parable of the loving father or compassionate father or whatever you would like to, to call him there. Um, what do you think the main point of this parable is? Let me, uh, since you've had time to discuss it, <clears throat> let me just call on some of you and, and others can uh, share as well. Uh, Samson, Samson Gaima, what do you think is the main point of this parable? Uh, we, we've, we've discussed and we, we thought that the main, main point in the parable is uh, forgiveness and acceptance to do with salvation. Okay, is that the, the uh, that God graciously and uh, uh, completely forgives us when we come back to Him, that kind of thing? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, Hannah, what do you think the main point of this parable is? Me, sir? Yes. Hannah. I think, sir, um, the parable was uh, Jesus told the parable to the in the in the context in chapter fifteen. Um, his audience were the Pharisees and tax collectors and sinners. So maybe um, what Jesus wants to tell these people is about. Um, he was trying to communicate to the Pharisees. He compared the Pharisees to the older son and the sinners and tax collectors to the younger son. So maybe um, Jesus wants to, like, it's like inviting, uh, <laughs> inviting these people <coughs> to come and to come to God and repent of their sins and ask forgiveness, like what the um, younger son did. Okay. That, that's all. <laughs> okay. Okay. Great. Great. Thank you. Uh, James, what do you think the main point of this parable is? I think uh, maybe it's the uh, unconditional love for the sons, both of them. All right. Okay. Okay. Who else would like to share what you think the main point of the parable is? Sir, I think the main point is, is about forgiveness. And in my okay. opinion, also the parable teaches that uh, no, matter, no matter what did you do, even God can give you more than you deserve as the case of the prodigal son. So this is my opinion. All right, great, thank you. Who else? Sir, yeah. our group, uh, our group yes. discussed that the main theme is the love of the father that reconciles and restores both of the sons. The All right. Restores and reconciles, yeah, thank you. All right, great, thank you. Anyone else? We discuss about grace, looking at it from the angle of grace, that in, we uh -huh. never, we, if, we, even if he didn't deserve it, he, uh, God, uh, the father received back the prodigal, but he still extended grace to the bitter other son. 
and still invited them into the family and uh, the family celebration. And uh, it should be looked upon it that way. And then the other option is that we, if we truly plant into our children the concept that we love them truly, mm -hmm. that uh, if they do walk away, they'll come back. And they'll know right. that they'll be loved when they come back. All right. As All a right. dad with two sons, it's kind of it's very personal to me, and <laughs> it mm -hmm. works. Great. All right. All right. Um, you know, one thing that, that we ought to realize about the parables is that these stories never really happened. Mm -hmm. Jesus isn't telling us things that have happened. These are made up stories. They are fiction. But Jesus is telling us these stories to make a point. So when he says there was a certain man, uh, that word certain uh, in the Greek is the word tis. You know, in English, we can say it was a certain man. It was a, a particular man. It happened to this man. That's not the way that word is in the Greek. It means anybody. Mm -hmm. It's the most general word that you can use. Somebody, you know. Um, so these stories, the prodigal son, the good Samaritan, these are not historical um, actions, you know. They are, they are made up stories that Jesus is telling to get a, the point across. Now, did you all realize that? Hmm. Okay, now this, the, the account of Jesus telling it is historical. Jesus told this story. But the story itself is not historical. It is fiction. It is a story that Jesus told. And uh, he probably told it many times in different contexts and maybe changed it a little bit, you know, in different contexts. So um, that's one thing that we need to see about the parables. Jesus isn't telling. Um, things like out of the newspaper. You know, that here's something that happened. This is an illustration that I want to give. He rather is, is telling stories, fictional stories, in order to get a point across. Okay, do we all understand that? Okay? Yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. And, and he's, he nowhere claims that these actually happened, you know? So we, we don't need to go back and look and see if we can find records of who this father was and exactly where he lived and the names of the sons. No, th there are none. He is just giving this as an example, okay? All right, let's go on and let me share the screen here. And let us ask how the parables. Sir, I have a question. Yes. Go ahead. So, if because as we can see, uh, people have different ways to interpret the parables. So, my question is. Uh, it's okay if parables speak to everyone in different way, or we need to analyze the the real meaning of the parable. Uh, very good question. Can we give a specific meaning to the parables, or can it mean for us, uh, however we relate to this story that Jesus told? And I think the answer to that is that we, we can determine what Jesus meant. Uh, Hannah, in her answer, looked at the context here, which Luke gives us, and that is going to help us in understanding the meaning of the parable. So the parable, like the other portions of Scripture, has one meaning. And we need to understand what that meaning is. Um, 
Do we all understand that? We can't simply pour into it however we're feeling. Um, we need to do our best to understand the point that Jesus is making. Now, we, we, we may not agree. And let me give you an example. Uh, Jesus told many stories that most of us interpret about the second coming of Christ. Uh, for example, uh, the, the ten maidens, uh, the ten virgins, five were wise and five were foolish. And uh, the wise ones were able to go into the, the marriage feast. And the foolish ones ran out of oil. And when they came, they could not get into the feast. And most of us interpret that in terms of the second coming. Are we ready for the second coming? N.T. Wright sees that parable and all of those parables similar to that as referring solely to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 without any further reference to the second coming of Christ. So not everybody agrees what the meaning is, but there was one meaning. And I don't think that we can uh, say that it, it can mean anything to anybody. Uh, there is only one meaning to the parables, and it's our responsibility to discover what that meaning is. Okay? Okay, thank you, sir. All right. Hey, let's take a break, a 10-minute break, and we'll see you back here in 10 minutes. All right, let us ask how should parables be interpreted? One thing that we see about parables is that since they are in story form, they make an impact that just a proposition doesn't. Um, for example, one could say God welcomes repentant sinners but that would not have nearly the impact of telling the story of the prodigal son. And um, so parables are unique like that. They can be more powerful than just simple statements. Let us look at historical methods for interpreting the parables. We have allegory. And the uh, great example of this is St. Augustine. For a thousand years, this was the, the major way that the parables were interpreted from Augustine all the way to the Reformation. In 1899, Adolf Uhlicker proposed a, a theory that held sway uh, for a hundred years. That is that all parables have only one point. Now, this is the uh, extreme opposite of the allegory where everything has a point. This theory has been accepted and uh, it's been a given for several generations. Now, there are problems with Ulicker's idea that a parable can have only one point. Even those who hold most adamantly to that position have to use allegory at times. They recognize that, uh, for example, in the parable of the wicked tenants in the vineyard, the tenants are the Jewish leaders, the son is Jesus, the owner of the vineyard is God, uh, and so forth. Craig Blomberg is representative of those who say that there are allegorical elements in the parables, even though they can't be allegorized the way Augustine did. Uh, Blomberg says, each parable makes one main point per main character, usually two or three in each case. And these main characters are the most likely elements within the parable to stand for something other than themselves, 
thus giving the parable its allegorical nature. For example, in the parable of the prodigal son that we just looked at, it has three main characters and teaches three lessons. This is according to Blomberg. Here is how Blomberg sees the, the three points. Uh, one, even as the prodigal always had the option of repenting and returning home, so also all sinners, however wicked, may confess their sins and turn to God in contrition. So for Blomberg, that's the first point of the uh, parable of the prodigal son. Second, even as the father went to elaborate lengths to offer reconciliation to the prodigal, so also God offers reconciliation or offers all people, however undeserving, lavish forgiveness of sins, even if they are, are sins, if they are willing to accept it. So the second point has to do with the second character, and that is God. God offers forgiveness for those who will accept it. And then third, even as the older brother should not have begrudged his brother's reinstatement, but rather rejoiced in it, so those who claim to be God's people should be glad and not mad that he extends his grace even to the most deserving. Now, I believe that we need to follow Blomberg here. We neither allegorize the way that Augustine did, nor do we see only one point in the parable. Rather, we see an allegorical element in the parables and interpret them accordingly. And he says, in most parables, there are going to be three main characters. And so we're going to have three lessons that we can get from the parable. Okay, um, let me just pause here. And um, let's see, we need to have Yi and Seibel Joyce and Phineas come back with us in the video. So as soon as you can do that, please do. All right, I would like to give N.T. Wright's eight points about parables. He says, number one, the most immediate literary background to the parables is that of apocalyptic. Apocalyptic um, deals with God's intervention in the world, uh, in the end times. And he says, this is the background that we need to uh, see uh, in the parables. Israel's God is going to come into her history to judge, redeem, and restore her. And these parables are also agents of what God is doing in the world. Secondly, Jesus used parables a great deal. Uh, he used a lot of parables, and he probably told them uh, with various uh, variations at different times. So he would perhaps tell it one way one time, another way another time. And so when we look at the Gospels and we see slight differences in the way parables are told, that doesn't mean that one of the Gospel writers is changing it. It may very well be that Jesus told the parables in different ways at different times. Number three, the parables made sense only within the whole context of Jesus' career. These didn't come from a later time. Uh, if you look at the context, what is being said here, it fits Jesus' lifetime, not the later lifetime of the church. Number four, the parables function the way all good stories function by inviting hearers into the world of the story. They were designed to break through worldviews and to create new ones. 
They encourage listeners to identify themselves in terms of the narrative. To see the point of the parable was to make a judgment on oneself. Maybe we, as, as we look at the parable of the prodigal son, can see ourselves in the prodigal. Maybe we can identify with the prodigal and realize that we need to come back, turn back to the father. We, we need to come home. Maybe some of us can identify with the elder brother and realize that, you know, we've been part of the household of God for a long time, and yet we're alienated from our father. We don't have a close relationship with him. We need that close relationship. Maybe it can speak deep to our hearts and bring us to repentance. I heard of one man who was telling the, the uh, parable of the, the prodigal son, and he asked the people in his small group, who do you relate to here? And one woman said that she related to the fattened calf. Well, I don't know. Probably none of us relate to the fattened calf. But we can allow these parables to speak to us, to change us, to bring us to repentance. Number four, the parables were therefore like the apocalyptic genre to which they, in some sense, belong, are subversive stories told to articulate and bring to birth a new way of being the people of God. And in close relationship to that, the parables were therefore essentially secretive. Now, when we say that they were subversive, it means that they are overturning those who are in power. If the parables are rightly applied, it's going to change everything. They are subversive in the sense that they don't come head on uh, and uh, come against those in power, but they are subversive in that they do it indirectly. Once their message is clearly heard, it can be very dangerous for those in power. The parables were therefore essentially secretive. You know, Jesus was not a universal teacher teaching timeless truths. Uh, the, the way that the first quest for the historical Jesus uh, viewed him, but rather he was uh, a starter of a movement which was going to grow like unobserved seed, turning into a plant before anyone had recognized. And there was something necessarily cryptic uh, Wright says here about the parables, something hard to understand, mysterious about the parables. Their import was so explosive that they could not necessarily be explained in public. One had to have ears to hear in order to really hear the message. Those who had ears to hear could understand what Jesus was talking about. The scribes and Pharisees often heard the stories, but they didn't get them. And when they do get them, like uh, the parable of the, uh, the uh, vineyard, where the, uh, those who tend the vineyard uh, rebel against the owner, <laughs> and they understand that that's talking about them, what do they do? They immediately go out and plan Jesus' death. So in a sense, the parables are secretive uh, for Jesus' own safety. If he came right out and said what he was doing, he may not have even lived as long as he did. 
The secretive function of the parables worked by analogy with other Jewish hermeneutical models, not least those of Qumran and the apocalyptic literature. And then finally, narrative analysis uh, of the parables is as yet in its infancy. Um, okay, do you have questions or comments here before we go on? Sir, uh, I think Bloomberg yeah. said this, the parable of uh, prodigal son, it has three points and then you said probably that it'd be correct. But uh, when you see the book of Luke chapter 15 is telling uh, the prodigal son, it says actually the uh, other parables are coming together for the message for the lostness of the point. And so I think for, for my opinion, it's like from the Luke 15, uh, from the chapter itself, I think it has maybe one, uh, one point not like Bloomberg is telling that the parable, one parable itself, but I think we have to see that through the, the previous or other parables, the parables of lost coin and lost ship like that, I think we have to see from the, the context, sir. That's right. That's right. Um, in each case, something is lost. We have a lost sheep, a lost coin, a lost son. Yes, sir. In each case, they are found. And in yes. each case, there is rejoicing. There yes. is more rejoicing in heaven over uh, one sheep that's found than over yes. the 99. There's right. rejoicing in heaven over one person who repents. And mm -hmm. uh, yes, they are parallel. So we need to look at them in the context of the other parables. That, that's a good point, Phineas. Thank you, sir. Any other comments or questions? Uh, sir? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but when we see the parallel of the different gospels, uh, we find the other points, but uh, uh, an evangelist of one gospel has his point. So, <clears throat> uh, we can find, how can I say? Uh, so, uh, when we see the dip, dip, say, see the similar parables in different gospels, but uh, is it possible that there are other interpretation that the evangelist in, intend for the readers to understand? Yes, yes. I, I think that the evangelist had uh, diff excuse me different purposes in including the parables in their gospels. Uh, for example, uh, we also have uh, in, in the, the parallel, um, God, uh, parallel passages, the story of the lost sheep, but it can make a different point than we have in Luke. And in fact, it may have actually been a different parable or the same parable told in a different way. So yeah, we do see different interpretations of the parables in the different gospels. So we, we, we need to be sensitive to that. Um, yeah. Thank you. Any, yes, any other questions or comments? All right. Um, let us look at George Ladd's guidelines for interpreting parables. He says that parables must not be interpreted as though they were allegories. And uh, of course, that is true. And we've, uh, we've seen that point. Um, Ladd goes on to say that the parables have one point. He follows Euliker here. And um, that is true sometimes. Sometimes a parable only has one point. I think what Ladd is saying here is that we need to realize that not everything in the parable is important in terms of its interpretation. Sometimes it's put in there just to make things interesting, 
to add, as, as Lad would say, local color to make it an interesting story. And so like, like Fee and Stewart say, when we're, when we're reading a passage in the epistles, we ask, what is the point? We ask that of the, of the parables too. And as we've seen here, it may have more than one point, but it doesn't mean that everything has a point. Okay, am I, am I coming across here? Okay, all right. Um, yeah, Euliker says it only has one meaning, and uh, Lad pretty much goes along with him to a certain degree. And secondly, parables must be understood in the historical setting of Jesus' ministry and not in the life of the church. These parables came from Jesus himself. They didn't come from the church at a later time, the way that the uh, that form criticism uh, says that they did. Okay, I'm looking for this quote in my notes. But I don't see it, so let's look at it right here. Uh, N.T. Wright, uh, the parables are not simply information about the kingdom, but are part of the means of bringing it to birth. They do not merely give people something to think about, they invite people into the new world that is being created and warn of dire consequences in the, if the invitation is refused. Jesus' telling of these stories is one of the key ways in which the kingdom breaks in upon Israel, redefining itself as it does so. So what he's saying here is that these are not just stories. Uh, it's not simply giving out information, you know, that we can just log up here, uh, stack it up in our brains, and now we know more. No, the parables are the means of bringing the kingdom to birth. It is when people are gripped by the message of the parables and change their lives or allow God to change their lives, that is the kingdom breaking in to our world. And so the uh, parables have that function, not simply to give information, but to change lives and in so doing, bring in the kingdom. All right, and let me quickly go to Snodgrass's guidelines for interpreting the parables. And we'll just hit these very quickly. He says, analyze the sequence, structure, and wording of the parable, including any parallels in the other gospels. So, so uh, analyze them in depth. Note cultural or historical features in the parable that provide insight. So look at the historical cultural background. Listen to the parables in the context of Jesus' ministry. What did it mean to him in his ministry, at this point in his ministry, and what, what uh, is the meaning in that context? We have to understand that first before we can get the meaning for us. Look for help in the context, but know that the context of many of the parables has not been preserved. So in many of them, we don't have a specific context. In some, we have a general context. For example, uh, in what part of Jesus' ministry was this given? Was it given in his ministry in Galilee? Uh, on the road to Jerusalem, in Jerusalem. Note how uh, the parable and its redactional shaping fit into the plan and purposes of the gospel in which it appears. Determine the function of the story as a whole in the teaching of Jesus and the evangelists. 
determine the theological significance of the story. The prodigal son. What does it tell us about God? The nature of God. It tells us some very powerful things about God. Pay special attention to the end of the parable. How does the parable end? That is going to be an important part in understanding it. Okay. Let us exegete a parable. And what I would like us to look at is uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan. I think we all know the parable. So I'm not going to take time to read it again. Um, but let us look at, first of all, the setting. Paul tells us that a lawyer, one who is an expert in the law of Moses, asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What were this, uh, what were the, this biblical scholar's motives in asking this question? I don't think he was sincerely wanting to know how to receive eternal life. Rather, he was an expert in the law, trying to test Jesus' understanding and seeing what this, uh, this upstart rabbi would say. What must I do to inherit eternal life was a much debated question in Jesus' day. Jesus' reply to him is, you're the expert in the law. What does your own law say? What do you recite in the synagogue? And the scholar's answer is flawless. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Now, the reply was rather embarrassing for this um, expert in the law. It made him look rather, rather dumb uh, because it showed that he already knew the answer to his own question. But it probably made him uneasy for another reason. He knew that he did not love God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength. And he did not love his neighbor as himself. And so in order to make himself look good, uh, that word is justify, justify himself, make himself look good. He asked Jesus another question. And who is my neighbor? Now, to the Jew of the first century, the neighbor was only fellow Jews. It was not Gentiles. For example, the Sabbath tradition laid down that if on the Sabbath a wall would collapse on somebody, that the Jew could dig down and see whether it was a Jew or not. If it was a Jew, they could, they could rescue him. If it was a Gentile, they would leave him. So for the first century Jew, the term neighbor had very definite boundaries. And this was important in a country which was overrun by the Gentiles. Now, in answer to this question, Jesus told this parable. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. Who this man was, uh, we don't know. Now, remember, this is not a historical. Uh, happening here that Jesus is, is uh, recording, is telling about. He didn't read about it in the newspaper. It's something that perhaps happened many times, and uh, he's not referring to one of those specific times. Undoubtedly, this person is presumed to be a Jew. The journey from Jerusalem to Jericho descended by 1,200 meters and was about 33 kilometers long. It was narrow and crooked and offered many opportunities for robberies to happen. In fact, it was called the Bloody Way, and it had that reputation all the way down to the 20th century. The robbers stripped the man, beat him, 
and left him lying there. Now, some other characters enter the story. The priest happened to come down that road. Oh, there is hope. A man of God was approaching. Surely, if you got to choose who came by, you would choose a priest. Surely God was intervening for this wounded man. But when the priest saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Why would he, a religious leader, not stop and help this man? What do you think? Why would he not stop? He must have been a Gentile. Uh, which one would be the Gentile? The injured man. The injured man. Um, maybe he was a Gentile. Uh, of course, we, we aren't told. But I think it's assumed that he was a Jew. Since Jesus is talking to Jews, and uh, he's assuming that they're one of his. Um, now, you have probably heard the speculation that he was on his way to the temple to serve in the temple. Yeah. And if the, the man died, it would make him ceremonially un, unclean so that he could not serve in the temple. Yeah. Okay, the, the point here is, if that is true, that the man valued ceremonial cleanliness more than the person's life. The only problem with that is that the text here says that the priest and Levite were going down the road. The word is katabino, to go down. Now, in English, if we say you're going down the road, uh, it might actually be going up, it might be going level, or it might be going down. So in English, to say you go down the road doesn't really mean up or down. It just means you're going on the road. But here, this Greek verb means actually to go down. It is always used of going from Jerusalem. It never is used going to Jerusalem. So if this priest was going away from Jerusalem, he's already done his uh, duty in the temple. So this could not prevent him from doing his duty in the temple because he's already done it and he's going home to Jericho. All right? Why then doesn't he stop? Well, we don't know. Perhaps he simply didn't care about the man. Perhaps he simply had no compassion. The same is true for the, the Levite who came. He served as the, the priest's assistant in the temple. He also goes by on the other side and leaves the man in the ditch. But then a Samaritan came by. Now to a Jew listening to this story, he would think that surely the Samaritan is the bad guy. Because in the eyes of the Jews, the Samaritans were the bad guys. They were the ones who wore the black hats, not the white hats. Okay, in the old westerns, uh, the bad guys wore the black hats and the good guys wore the white hats. Well, the Samaritan would certainly wear a black hat in this story. There was a huge hostility between the Samaritans and the Jews. And I, I won't take time to go into that, but it's a 450 year history that they have here. Um, desecrating each other's temple or the Jews destroyed uh, the Samaritans temple uh, in years past. But it was a Samaritan who stopped and helped this man when the Jews refused to do that. He stopped, he got off his donkey. He had pity on the man, Jesus says. 
He put bandages on him, probably a head cloth or an undergarment. He put oil mixed with wine on his wounds. He put the man on his donkey and took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he gave the innkeeper enough money to keep the man there for about three and a half weeks. He asked him to take care of him and promised to reimburse him when he returned. And then Jesus asked the expert in the law, which of these do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And this, this scholar said, the one who had mercy on him. Notice that, that he won't even say the Samaritan. He won't allow himself to let that word come out of his mouth. The one who had mercy on him. And to that, Jesus said, go and do likewise. And that is the story, the parable of the Good Samaritan. But what does it say to us? 2,000 years later, what is Jesus teaching us? We're not going to interpret this allegorically. When we do, we miss the meaning of the parable. Augustine's interpretation guaranteed that the people who heard him did not get the message of the parable. Let's look at it in context. The religious scholar asked what he must do to inherit eternal life. So what Jesus is saying has something to do with how a person may receive eternal life. Jesus' answer was, love God and love your neighbor. In other words, you must have a personal relationship with God, and you, as a result, will love your neighbor. It is God's love in our hearts that enables us to love others. Jesus told this story in answer to the question, and who is my neighbor? What people qualify to receive my love? Where do I draw the limits? But notice that Jesus never answers that question, at least not in the way he asked it. Jesus rather faced him with the question, to whom am I a neighbor? And the story plainly says that no lines can be drawn. Any person genuinely in need is my neighbor. Or you could say that Jesus does answer his question, but from a, diff a completely different perspective. Jesus answers it from the perspective of not the man on the donkey, but the man in the ditch. In that case, if you're in the ditch, who is your neighbor? It's now not a question of drawing boundaries as to who you will help. Anyone who helps you is your neighbor. The priest and the Levites couldn't put themselves in the situation of the man in the ditch. They couldn't put themselves in the wounded man's shoes, but the Samaritan could. He had compassion on the man. And the word compassion means to suffer with to be able to identify with the man's feelings and empathize with him and see the situation from his perspective. This isn't what the lawyer wanted to hear. He wanted the lines drawn tightly around him so that he could ignore people in need and not have a bad conscience. After all, reaching out to strangers and people not like us could be risky business. The man lying by the road could have been a setup for a robbery. Let me ask you, where do you draw your lines? What people qualify for your help? What people don't qualify for your help? Maybe God wants to change those boundaries in your life. I want to tell you a story. 
During the Second World War, there were a group of American soldiers fighting in France. They had a skirmish, uh, a fight with the uh, Germans, and one of the Americans was killed. They went to a Catholic church uh, because they wanted a place to bury their fellow soldier, and there was a cemetery there. So they went to the priest, and they asked if they could bury uh, the, uh, the dead soldier there in the cemetery. And the priest uh, asked if he was a baptized Catholic. And they said, no, uh, he's a Protestant. And the priest said, well, I'm sorry, but he can't be buried in our cemetery. It's only for Catholics. And so they went outside the fence and they buried him, they dug a grave, they buried him there outside the fence, and they went away, and the next morning they came to put a marker on the grave. And as they walked down the fence, they couldn't find the grave. And they couldn't understand this. They knew that the day before they had buried him there, but now they could not find the grave. What was going on? So they went to the priest, and they told him the situation, and the priest said, you know, I couldn't sleep last night because I knew it wasn't right not to let him be buried in the cemetery. And so early this morning, I got up and I moved the fence to include him. Maybe God wants for us to move our fences. Maybe he wants us to include those that have been outside our boundaries. Maybe God wants just to explode our boundaries and say anyone truly in need is deserving of our love. Go and do likewise. That is the point of the parable. Okay, do you have questions or comments here? Questions, comments? So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I was going to say the same. Uh, it's like the first time I've heard it interpreted that way. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, you uh, see, just a, just a question. Yes. Is it okay for us to use a lot of parables, you know, uh, or no? Like make up stories then? Sure. As people. I mean, it, it's, a, it, it's a great way of getting a point across. But don't, don't tell your people that it really happened. If it's a made-up story, you know, <laughs> don't act like it isn't a made-up story. Okay? Um, now, let's look at Blomberg here. Uh, in, uh, in interpreting the parable of the Good Samaritan, he says that there are three lessons here. One. From the example of the priest and Levite comes the principle that religious status or legalistic cas uh, casuistry does not excuse lovelessness. Okay, so that's the first character. Second, from the Samaritan, one learns that one must show compassion to those in need, regardless of the religious or ethnic barriers that divide people. And then third, from the man in the ditch emerges the lesson that even one's enemies is one's neighbor. So again, uh, the way Blomberg interpreted the uh, uh, prodigal son with three characters and three lessons. So here we have three characters and three lessons. And I think this is a good way to interpret the parables look at the main characters and normally there will be two three maybe four uh, in rare cases 
and see what lessons we learn from those uh, characters. Okay, our time is up. Uh, do you have any final questions or comments? All right, God bless you. Uh, have a wonderful weekend. And I will come to you next Wednesday morning from sunny California. God bless Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Same Thank to you. you. Thank you. God bless you, sir. Thank you, everyone.